comes to his father one day and says, Father, give me my inheritance money. Now, in the Jewish culture, that was as good as saying. Today, a young man going to his dad and saying, I wish you were dead, because you only get inheritance money when you die. So, very offensive thing to say. Clearly, this young man of son didn't have a good relationship with his father. Quite common today, isn't it? And the father, knowing that he loved his son and he agreed to it, and he gave this young man his money, and it would have been a lot of money. This young man, this prodigal son, as uh, the old Bible used to call him, then went off and lived his own lifestyle. He lived in a way that had nothing to do with how his father had brought him up. The young man went off and lived in sexual immorality, spending money like there's no tomorrow. This prodigal son went and did, using his dad's money, everything that he thought would make him happy. And Jesus says in the end, after some time, the prodigal son was not happy. His idea of how to live a life did not work out. And Jesus says of the young man, this prodigal son, he ended up, like many do today, in the pigsty. Having to rent himself out just to get a meal. But this young man didn't forget the love that his father had for him. And in the depths of his debauchery, sin, messed up life, and he knew it was his own fault, he came to his senses, the Bible calls it repentance. He changed his mind. My friends, today, that story that Jesus told happens all the time. It happens when you and I grow up and we look at the gifts we have from God who created us. Maybe you're good at accounts, you're good with numbers. Maybe you're an arty farty type. Maybe you're good at art or music or architecture. My friend, God gave you and I the gifts we have. It's life forever. My friend today, get desperate. Use what God's given you. If you're a clever club, if you've got energy, be like Zacchaeus, who didn't give up when his community elbowed him out the way and would not let him see Jesus. He didn't give up. He used his intellect and his energy and he ran ahead, climbed a tree and waited till Jesus came by. But, uh, Zacchaeus, Bartimaeus, the woman with the hemorrhage of blood, they pursued Jesus until they got his attention. That is what you need to do. If you don't, you'll just carry on and your life will get worse and worse. You may look good on the outside for a few years. You may have a house or a car or a marriage that's intact, but on the inside, my friend, as far as your reputation with God goes, you're in deep feces, deep feces with God. He doesn't look on our, on our appearance. You might look upon me and think, oh, what a good looking guy, and I'd have to agree with you, I know that. But I could have a dirty mind, a dirty heart. When I leave here today, I could go home and smack my wife around. Look at pornography, you don't know. The appearances, more often than not, are deceiving, my friend. But God 
is not deceived by anything. He's not fooled. All things are uncovered before the eyes of the Lord. And my friend today, that means that he sees you. He knows what goes on in your life. And he's not frowning, snarling at you. He's saying to you, come, come unto me and I'll rescue you. Let go of that which is stopping you coming to me. My friend today, do not be deceived. The Lord Jesus wants you back where you belong, in his family. God bless you today. How do you put things before God in your life? You might be a lover of self. The Bible says that in the last days men will be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of pleasure. Lovers of money. Is it money that you put before God? Is it your family? Is it your business? What is it that you put before God? God said, you shall have no other gods before me. It says in the Bible, it says in the Ten Commandments, it says, You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. It said, He will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now you just ask yourself this Do you use the name Christ? Do you use the name of Jesus? Do you use the name of God? in a way that would dishonor him? Do you use the name of Christ as a curse word? Does it just roll off your tongue? We had a guy here earlier, I asked him the same question, and right there in the middle of the street, he was happy to blaspheme the living God. He was happy to curse Christ right there in the street openly. Now the Bible says he will not leave him unpunished men and women who takes his name in vain it's not a light thing it's not a small thing to use the name of Christ to use the name of Jesus to use the name of God as a swear word it's not a small thing now I know most of you do it in ignorance many of you have learned it from your parents but just because your parents did it, just because people in society curse Christ, use the name of Christ as a curse word, it doesn't mean it's right. No, God sees. God sees. And whether you do it in ignorance or whether you do it in absolute, uh, you know, out of complete hatred and disregard for the living God, you must understand. That you sinning, you are violating his moral law. And God, men and women, God sent his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered and bled upon the cross to save you from the wrath of God, to save you from the penalty that your sins deserve. Now what is the penalty, men and women? What is the penalty that your sins deserve? Well, it's eternity separated from God. You see, heaven, heaven is a place of, of holiness. It's a place of purity. It's a place of light. It's a place of righteousness. There's going to be no sin. There's going to be no sinner in heaven. But sinners are all going to be cast into the lake of fire. Where they will suffer the vengeance of God, the wrath of God, for all of eternity. Make no mistake about it, men and women of Leeds. If you die without Christ, if you die in your sins, if you die without Christ as your saviour, God will judge you on the day of judgment for how you've lived. And he will cast you into the lake 
which burns with fire and brimstone, and there you will spend eternity in eternal torment, separated from all that is holy, all that is good, all that is happiness, all that is joyful, all that is pleasant, forever and ever and ever. And if I love you, as God tells me to love you, I'm going to stand here today in this town centre and warn you, and warn you of the wrath of God and warn you of the wrath to come. If I care for you, I'm going to tell you how you can be saved from the judgment and wrath of Almighty God. Now make no mistake about it, men and women of need. Your sin will find you out. God knows all about you, everything about you. Now you have forgotten most of the wicked things that you have done. You've tried to get it away from your mind. But God sees. And we want to preach and bring the, the light of God's truth to you today. And I want to preach the law of God today. That your conscience might show you your need for a saviour. Because every single one of us needs a saviour. Every one of you. Whether you are here as a council worker in town today, whether you are a police officer, whether you are a visitor, whether you are young and old, whoever you are, everybody needs a saviour. And there's only one saviour, and that saviour is the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. Amen. Who left his throne above to come to this, this world below to save you reconcile you to God. It says in the Ten Commandments, it says you shall not murder. That's what it says. It says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. It's a serious thing to murder someone. It's a serious thing to take the life of an innocent. Now I know most of you are going to be walking past and feeling quite happy in yourself that you've not murdered a person. But how many of you, how many of you today in our culture consider that killing the life of the innocent in the womb is murder in the eyes of God? How many of you consider that killing a baby inside the womb, that, that innocent life that God has created? through the intimacy of the man and the woman to take that life, to take the life of the innocent in the womb is murder in the eyes of God. Yes, abortion is murder. Abortion is murder. The Bible says that God hates the hands of those who shed innocent blood. Taking the life of the innocent is murder in the eyes of God. And God calls out to you, abortion is murder, young lady. Abortion is murder. Taking the life of the innocent is murder in the eyes of God. It's never right to take the life of any innocent being, whether that being is uh, in, in, in the womb or outside the womb. It's never right. And God looks down, men and women. God looks down from heaven. And he looks upon modern British society. Oh, he's angry, men and women. God is angry with what he sees going on in our nation. God is angry with the thousands and thousands of innocent babies being murdered in the womb every year in this nation. God looks down from heaven, he sees the immorality, he sees the sexual immorality, he sees the wickedness that is going on, the fornication, the homosexuality, he sees it all. And God is angry with the wicked every day, and he calls out to the people of this nation, 
God calls out to the men and women of Leeds and he calls out to you to repent. He calls out to you to come to your senses. To rethink, to turn to God and to put your trust in the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for all sins, was buried and rose up again from the dead on the third day. He is your only hope. Christ is your only hope, men and women. It says in the Ten Commandments, it says, You shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. That's what God said. And the Lord Jesus Christ, He said these words. He says, he says it was said, by those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Now let me ask you this question. Do you look with lust? Do you look at women? Do you look at men and lust after them in your you see, God, men and women, He is a God that sees right into the depth of your being. God doesn't just look at the outward actions. God sees the motive of your heart. He sees the intent of your heart. He sees what's going on in your heart. He sees what's going on in your mind. It says in the Old Testament, says that God looked down and saw that the wickedness of man was great in all the earth and that every thought and intent of the heart was only evil continually. And the Bible says in those days before the flood that God, he just wiped, he just wiped all those people away in his wrath and in his uh, anger against the wickedness of man. His wrath came in those days when he flooded the earth and destroyed man from the face of the earth. And believe me, God is coming in great judgment. And this world will experience the great judgment of God when Christ comes to judge the wicked. Thank you.